teacher. This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such an adulterer should be stoned. But what do you see? In the Ten Commandments it says, you shall not commit adultery. The law says such an adulterer should be stoned. We want to know your opinion. Throughout Bible history, God sent many to care for his flock, but only few were faithful to truly nurse and care for the flock. In Ezekiel, God reduced the shepherds who did not do to fully to care for the flock. Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of the visible who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. In response to this scandal, God sent a true shepherd, Jesus. Jesus for, Jesus for truthfully say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Jesus brought heaven to earth. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to be served, and to give his life, and his life as a ransom for men. By his coming to earth, Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God. Jesus went through all the cities and villages, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. By his life and ministry, he demonstrated how the subjects of his kingdom should think, speak, and act. In other words, we should all be living Christ in our everyday life. Jesus was different. He did not take his advantage, his comfort. No, he chose to be born to a lowly maid, who entered the world in a cold and lowly state, to redeem himself to the insignificant and outcast in society. Unlike the false shepherd of Israel, he did not seek his own well-being, though he was rich, yet for our sins he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. What if Jesus would have looked over the splendor of heaven, and then upon the broken, cold, dark, sink of the world, and said, I'm staying home? But he did. He chose to partake in flesh and blood, and became like his brethren in every way. In Ezekiel it is written, And when I passed by you, and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. Jesus poured himself out for the thief. His whole life was consumed with reaching out to the hurt, the broken, the hungry, the dying, the sick, and even the dead. He came to save his people from their sins. Let this mind be in us, but was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus did not condescendingly look down on anybody for his pain and his hurt. His love was not confined to one nation or one nation. Quiet, please. His love had no boundaries. He was a barrier buster, a wall breaker. He did not avoid an outcast, a four time divorcee, a Samaritan, with whom the Jews had no fellowship. One day, Jesus and his disciples walked through Samaria and stopped at the gate of the wedding. It is the sixth hour that's rest of Jacob's life. We can go to Tychar to buy food. If you have your own supply of living water. If only you knew what I could give you. 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and who drank from it himself? Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I should give him shall never thirst. Won't well, that be nice? In fact, the water that I should give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Really? Really. Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Go, call your husband, and come back here. I have no husband. You have what is said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband either, in that you spoke truly. <laughs> I see. You are a prophet. You are here to preach to me. No. Usually the good thing about coming here alone, I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes, too many, but it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews insist that in Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say this is because the temple is there. Yes, and we are not allowed to go there. I'm here to break those barriers. Time is coming when either on this mountain or in Jerusalem we worship the Father. Then where am I supposed to go when I meet God? God is fair. The time is coming and it's now here where it would not matter where you worship the Father. Only that you do in spirit and truth. He wants your whole heart and mind. That's the kind of worship where he is looking for. But not me. It does not matter where you are from or what you've done. Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust anyone. I to whom you speak, and me. The Messiah? Why are you talking to me, a sinner, an outcast? Is that why you know all these things? I came to Samaria just to meet you. This was not an accident. I am tired of being an outcast, <clears throat> of having to avoid the crowds, tired of life. Tired of men, tired of everything. I hadn't found fulfillment in anything. And at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you see for? Why are you talking with him? Can you please give me from this living water that you spoke of earlier? Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Rabbi, my food is to do with a thief who sent me into who would I say unto you, but lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready to harvest. Yeah. Jesus graciously and tenderly reached out to the Samaritan woman. He was seeking lost souls. This was the harvest that he was talking about. Jesus did not give aid to the issue at hand. He spoke the truth, yet was gentle and compassion. Jesus pointed the woman to himself to show her that he was the only one who could quench her unquenchable thirst and heal her sin ravaged heart. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Than it's required to keep the extra for themselves. 
Assuredly, I say to you, it is difficult for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Lord, then who can be saved? With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone, my father can say, I restore a poor Today, salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. <laughs> Christ was not condoning the sins of either the self righteous Pharisees nor the tax collector. He was asserting that there is forgiveness for even the worst of sinners who will repent. Jesus associated with tax collectors that he might say, Let this mind be must be the gospel in Christ Jesus. Pharisees brought a woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus. Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very end. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? In the Ten Commandments it says, you shall not commit adultery. The law says such an adulterer should be stoned. We want to know your opinion. He who is without sin among you, throw the first stone. He was dead. He is alive again. He was lost. He has been found. 
if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? Jesus, at the loss, brought back what was driven away, bound up the broken, and healed what was sick. He was truly the Good Shepherd. Christ left as an example. Let us follow His footsteps.